You are in for a real treat uh, this evening. I am uh, blessed to be able to welcome Douglas Rushkoff to Virtual Futures, something that's almost been five years in the, in the works. Now, there's people in your life that you admire a great deal, and then you meet them. <laughs> and that changes. Uh, but there are also people in your life you admire, and then you meet them, and you feel like your admiration was not significant enough. And Douglas is thankfully in the latter category. But first, a, a quick introduction uh, for all of you guys. My name is Luke Robert Mason. I'm the director of what we call Virtual Futures. And for those who are here for the first time, the Virtual Futures Conference occurred at the University of Warwick in the mid-90s. And to quote its co-founder, it occurred at a tipping point in the technologization of first world cultures. Whilst it was most often portrayed as a techno-positivist festival of accelerationism towards a post-human future, the Glastonbury of cyberculture, as The Guardian so wonderfully put it, its actual aim hidden behind the brushed steel, the silicon, the jargon, the designer drugs, the charismatic prophets, and the techno parties was much more sober and much more urgent. What Virtual Futures did was cast a critical eye over how the phenomenal changes in how humans and non-humans engage with emerging scientific theory and technological development. This Salon series completes the conference's aim to bury the 20th century and begin work on the 21st. So, let's begin. For many in this audience, the individual sitting next to me needs no introduction. Very simply, he was named one of the world's most 10 influential thinkers by MIT and has written 15 best-selling books in which he coined terms such as viral media, social currency, and digital natives. But I best know Douglas Rushkoff as my Sherpa of choice in understanding the increasingly perplexing present. And that's what we're going to be doing tonight. My first encounter with Douglas was through a very battered and poorly laminated copy of his 1994 book, Siberia, Life in the Trenches of Hyperspace. I was a 20-something undergraduate at the University of Warwick, and I'd just uncovered the existence of a mid-90s cyberculture conference called Virtual Futures. I understood what happened. I had digital copies of the conference program, but I didn't understand why it happened. And Siberia was the book that opened my eyes to the techno-cultural optimism of the mid-90s, the transcendent possibilities of cyberspace. It was a book that, for me, read much less like a non-fiction journalistic account and more like a cyberpunk thriller on technology, drugs, and subculture. I was hooked. Then I closed the book. I refreshed my Facebook, looked around, and realized we're all fucked. My first in real life encounter with Douglas was in New York in August 2015. I asked him to moderate a virtual futures panel at IBM Watson, New York. It was possibly, the, uh, it was possibly IBM Watson's first public event where folks like us and the virtual futures community had been invited behind the curtain, and thanks to Douglas, it's probably their last public event. Uh, and we're, this, we're this still holding the video. We're, we're told we are allowed to release that this year. It's been two years we've been trying to release, release that video. And I remember Doug, getting, uh, getting Doug actually, to agree to contrib uh, contribute to, um, to that panel. And I remember it, I don't know how you remember it, but I remember it being an ordeal all of its own. And I know Dan O'Hara, my co-founder remembers it being an ordeal. You uh, seem to remember you calling me a number of times to test me, uh, test me on whether I was some like transhumanist kid. Uh, I think you wanted to. I think you wanted to know if I wanted to upload my mind, or freeze my body, or cut off my limbs, or change my gender. And you were quite insistent on the whole changing gender thing. You were almost obsessed with that. It was like, what's your thing about changing genders and uploading minds? Uh, but the tone of the conversation, which essentially was like, so what's your deal, buddy? And I'm really, I'm really mean it. Like, what's your deal, buddy? Like, we're doing this thing at IBM Watson, but Virtual Futures is a nonprofit. Like, how does this whole thing work out? It was frustrating, and it was challenging, and I felt I was being tested, and it was the reason I truly respect this gentleman. So long story short, Doug agreed 
uh, to come to IBM Watson and suffered, I mean experienced, <laughs> the immersion experience. Uh, it's, uh, if, you, if you don't know about this, IBM Watson has this kind of space in the middle of New York and the, uh, and the IBM Watson experience is an exclusive experience they only give to their Fortune 50 clients and I think this is the first time they let artists and cultural theorists play with it. Uh, we were ushered into what is essentially like it's a planetarium style space and then we were all, uh, I, I don't want to say forced, but we were all forced to watch an interactive video about how little Johnny uh, had an unknown disease and couldn't be diagnosed by a human doctor. Johnny was about to die. But don't fear, Dr. IBM Watson was able to overcome the dumb human biases and save little Johnny and at the end IBM Watson was revealed to us. And it was revealed to us behind a double mirror and we saw what was essentially a lit up server rack. And IBM Watson spoke to us in a very sort of how uh, 2001 Odyssey voice going, don't worry, I've saved Johnny. <laughs> so despite all this showmanship, what I remember most vividly was, and I, I just found out two seconds before getting on this stage that my memory is actually wrong, but I thought I saw Douglas Rushkoff reach into his coat pocket and pull out what I swore were those 90s 3D goggles with the red and the blue filter. And I remember you sitting there with this kind of faux look of awe on your face going, ooh, ooh, IBM, ooh, very well done, IBM. And it was this one small act of defiance that managed to uh, momentarily collapse this whole multi-million dollars worth of immersion as I sat and watched Doug sit there and go, oh yeah, okay, seen this before, I've seen this before. And it's, that's, and it's that exact sort of act that I see as Douglas's genius. It's the ability to jar us out of our consensual hallucination and see the world, digital or otherwise, with new eyes. So, to help us navigate the new normal of now, I give you Douglas Rushkoff. Oh, thank you. So I want to start with Siberia and just ask you what happened. What happened, Doug? What happened to the net? And what did you think it was going to be and, and how did we end up here? The first time you take acid. <laughs> you assume that everybody has that trip. And what you find out is that the trip someone has is dependent on set and setting. So the same is true of digital technology, which is essentially a psychedelic substrate. Now, when I wrote Siberia, what I was trying to do was to prepare society for the acid trip of digital technology. What is it going to mean when you're in a hypertext reality? What is it going to mean where any, when anything that you imagine you will be able to behold, where your hallucinations will manifest? And the people who were building uh, digital technologies at that point were grateful deadheads, were psychedelics people. I mean, the, the Intel and Northrop Grumman and Apple, they all understood that they needed to hire psychedelics people to build these spaces because only psychedelics people were unafraid to construct realities. Them and children, who were also pretty good at it, the, you know, the 12 and 13 year old little hackers. And Just as someone can do acid in the ACDC parking lot um, and have a very different experience than you will in a, 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 an acid test or a be-in, uh, when, if we're among friends, when capitalists take digital technology, what happens is it amplifies a very particular worldview that they have and sends them on a really strange path where Jeff Bezos buys Whole Food, you know? Um, it's, it's scary. I mean, what happened was, I mean, originally in Siberia, there was this merging of psychedelia and digital technology, which was attempting to retrieve really 1960s values. And 
That was really, really frightening to uh, business as usual. It was certainly frightening to corporate America. It was very frightening to the media industry. They found out things like the average internet-connected home was watching nine hours less commercial television a week. I mean, there were all these horrifying uh, uh, possibilities that things would get out of control. And they um, recontextualized the internet. Uh, as something else. And Wired Magazine was really the best at doing this, to say that, no, no, don't, yes, this is a revolution, but the way that they phrased the internet revolution was actually reactionary. What they did was decide that, no, don't worry, this will not change capitalism, this will reify capitalism in an entirely new, at an entirely new level. And Wired said, don't worry, we're going into a long boom of unprecedented proportion where the markets will expand infinitely forever. Thanks to this stuff. That we now have infinite surface area for marketplaces because of virtual spaces. And what they didn't really, either didn't take into account or did, just didn't care about was the fact that the surface area of humanity is limited. We only have so much time, we only have so much attention. And what we started to do was, you know, rather than really, although in addition to mining the planet for resources, because as we know, digital technology externalizes a whole lot of stuff. You look at your iPhone, it looks like a nice little thing, but it's actually in that iPhone are all the children being sent into caves in Africa to get the rare earth metals for it and everything else. I mean, but they, they ended up colonizing human time and attention which is why we're experiencing so much stress. We're now in their bad trip, if you will. I mean, you look at America. What is America going through? I mean, you guys are too. It's what happens if you take an unprepared civilization and migrate it to an essentially psychedelic substrate? <laughs> you get this bizarre bad trip. You know, and then at the same time, you use everything that we know about the human psyche and teach kids in the captology labs at Stanford how to manipulate people, how to addict them, how to disorient them, how to, uh, how to uh, detour around the neocortex straight to the, 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 the reptilian brain and trigger uh, impulse, the most impulsive fear-based fight or flight responses and have them carry around the devices that do this 24-7, what do you think is going to happen? Is this. Right? So, you know, it's not digital technology's fault. It's not even really capitalism's fault so much as capitalism plus digital technology yields this thing that we're going through. So would you argue we should return to 90s values, or was that any value set in the 90s? Is it golden age thinking? <laughs> to think that there was something very, very special and very exciting about the net as it existed back then. The day that Netscape went public, which was a big day for a lot of us, because it was really the first day that the sort of the, the shareware internet sort of really transposed itself into the IPO world, was the same day that Jerry Garcia died. <laughs> so, I mean, yes, it's a coincidence, but it feels like we, we, we tend to leave behind value systems from previous eras as if they're obsolete without recognizing that we can retrieve certain values from the past without going to the past. We can retrieve the commons of late medievalism without returning to the Middle Ages. We can retrieve the peace and love and connectivity and, lo and, and humanism, uh, well, real humanism, of the 1960s without becoming hippies and, you know. And but, but then the question is, how? By, and this is hard for a lot of people, but uh, by accepting that we have the agency and autonomy to do so, you know, by uh, uh, accepting our role as the real programmers of our reality. 
yeah. and the, not relinquishing it so readily. You know, it's, it's, it's shocking to me how we've, instead of retrieving human values, what we've done is accepted the values of good, not even good, but, but let's call it, the values of good computing as the values of good living. So are, am I fast? Am I efficient? You know, am I, you know, can I parallel process? No, you can't parallel process. You, you're serial. Sorry. You know, and, and fast isn't always good. You know, I mean, for many of us. Uh, and efficiency, what does efficiency do? Is it takes away all the nooks and crannies, all the liminal spaces, all the anomalous behaviors, all the paradoxes and ambiguity that makes human life worth living. You know, the difference, as I see it, between humans and machines, the easiest difference is, you know, when, you're, when you do something strange and your dog is there and your dog goes, you know that tilt? <laughs> Human beings can do that and not only do it, but love it. We can live there. We can live with, with sustained ambivalence and ambiguity. And machines don't do that. That's not what we program them to do anyway. Even fuzzy is not, it's just they guess but they, they guess fuzzy, but they finish, they, they conclude, they resolve. But didn't sustained ambivalence, ambivalence get us here in the first place? I'm sitting there, I'm sitting there looking no, at No, rush going, to judgment got us here in the first place. Rush to unicorn, rush to, where, where, where's my peace? When am I gonna get there? What, you know, no, you get, it, it didn't, it didn't. But it looks so shiny and new and exciting and we get very kind of tied in with the future being this awesome thing. We don't hear a virtual future, it's something that we try not to do. Right, but, but that's because we commodified the technology. So we made the technology itself the thing that we wanted instead of the experiences that we could generate with technology. So, you know, we started to see, you know, we don't connect to other humans on, I mean, gosh, I have more intimate experiences on an IRC text-based chat than I ever did on Facebook. So should we be more tilt head to the future, in other words. We should be tilt head about everything. <laughs> <laughs> Just always, that's always. A, well, essentially, yeah. How long can you keep that, that going? That's voltage, that's life. That's life, when you finish, you conclude and well, be done. But isn't it, the, the reason why the operating systems for how we live our lives get locked in is because we can't sustain that sort of ambivalence, that questioning, we, we need to pay our rent, our mortgage, we, we need to just get on with life, living life and making sure that the tax man gets paid at the end of the year. The tax man and the rentier are certainly embedded in our economy, but that's not an excuse to say, okay, because we're being economically exploited by these bastards, we should <laughs> surrender our humanity. Doesn't work, you're right, doesn't work. No. We didn't no. know, to a large degree, I don't think we knew we were surrendering a large degree of uh, our No, humanity. we probably wouldn't have done it. So, so this capsology thing you're talking about, I mean, what is it? What are the nuances of that? That is the way to kind of extract data from us without us ambiently knowing it. How do we, how do we fucking question that stuff? I'm questioning that stuff. <laughs> Just, we do it in locked in rooms in the middle of, in the middle of a hospital club once, once, a, once a year, once a blue moon. I mean, what is it we need to do on the ground, I think, is the, is the, the question. Because we, we host a lot of these chats, and, the, and at the end, Dan and I sit down, and we look at each other, and we have a beer, and we go, all right, now what the fuck do we do? You know, how do we take whatever, everything we've heard and action it out into the world? One, uh, don't worry about scaling mm -hmm. what you've learned. Because mm -hmm. then you're going back into, their, into the industrial age paradigm. You know, instead, if, what if you just trickle it? But then it becomes, but then it it becomes like a, a small subset of people going, oh, they don't know. They don't know what's happening to them. Or oh, if only they knew. It's a, <laughs> it, it's a conspiracy. What does conspire, the words, the, the, the Latin conspire, what does that word come from? Con, to breathe together. Conspire, breathe together. Yeah, you breathe together in small groups and another small group and another small group. I mean, everybody here's got their own small group of 12 people and that, 
It trickles. I don't think it's a matter of finding, oh, let's get this on you know, TV. Let's get the website. I'm going to create the website that aggregates all of the websites for all the people that are aggregating the websites of the other people who know what this is so we can build our movement. And you know, you know, the whole thing is you know, humanity doesn't happen at scale. It, it doesn't. It doesn't. So, and, and can you be? That's the hard part, especially when Zuckerberg is so important. Um, <laughs> Can you do it? Can, are you, can you be satisfied with a local reality? I mean, that's why they wouldn't, with this, I, I just you know, starting a book now, I was ambivalent about doing another book because doing a book um, is something that's happening at scale. I've written 15 books. I've had my turn. You know what I mean? I've, I, I've had more than my turn. So you know, how dare I now try to take people's attention for another thing. So you know, I took the smallest advance of the four that were offered. I went with Norton, who's a, an editor-owned, uh, uh, kind of almost a platform co-op of a publisher, and uh, going to write a little book and kind of see what happens. But well, let's talk about that little yeah. book. And I'm sure it won't just be a be a little book. Yeah. It's called Team Human: A Manifesto. Right. So, what is Team Human? We're team human. We're the human. <laughs> we we're team down. human. Um, and everybody gets to be on team human. I mean, <laughs> the, 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 I came up with team human, I mean, pretty far back. It was, was, you know, before I was working on, uh, it was when I was working on programmer be programmed, you know, the, which is this idea that you're either, you know, programming your reality or your reality is being programmed uh, for you. And I had, Gotten upset with the uh, nothing personal. I gotten upset with the singularity transhumanist people because um, they kept they kept talking about the, the idea that humanity is just one link in the evolutionary chain through which you know information has been evolving and looking for more and uh, looking for greater states of complexity. And humanity right now is the greatest state of complexity for information, but computers, once the singularity happens, computers will be. And then human beings are really only important insofar as we can keep the machines running. You know, that we should pass the torch to those machines, maybe follow Kurzweil and use his, his, you know, his Google company to upload our, our brains into the, the database and admit that we've been surpassed. And I would say, no, humans are special. We're quirky. We have nooks and crannies. We're strange. We're wonderful. I, there should be a role for human beings in the digital future. And they said to me, oh, Doug, you only say that because you're human. <laughs> and I realized, yeah, damn straight. Yeah, I'm human. OK, I'm on team human. So I'm going to, to I don't think it's hubris to say, I think there should be a place for our species in the future scheme. I, and I think there's things about us that we don't yet know how they work, that even if a seven-step algorithm on Facebook can make us do something stupid, it doesn't mean that seven-step algorithm really understands who we are. It understands our amygdala, but it doesn't understand us. And it doesn't understand us in concert with one another. So I'm not talking about just humans, but team human. I believe that hu humanity is a team sport. You know, being human is something that you do with others, that you can't be a human isolated from others and still be human. And uh, I started to realize that the forces that don't agree with that, the forces that don't like humans, atomize us to disempower us. You know, it's, it's, I mean, the old divide and conquer, but um, we end up in virtual futures where we may as well or we will be more likely to be interacting with an algorithm than with another person. And you interact with an algorithm, you're no longer, um, you lose your power, you lose your solidarity. I mean, so you can look at it from a Marxist perspective or a humanist perspective or any perspective, but if you don't have other people on your team, then you're no longer really a people. Don't, don't you think, uh, and I, I really don't want to make this a discussion on transhumanism, but don't you think the transhumanist guys, to a degree, have a little bit of an obsession about the human? They're not post-human. They almost want to fix this human we have now, whether we freeze this yeah. human we have now, or we, we take the mind of this human we have now and just fix it in silicon, 
or just keep the kind of human construct we have now and then just replace the little bits. They're kind of exactly. obsessed with the human. They are. They it's wouldn't, the post-humanists we need to worry about. Yeah. You know, those guys are scared of AI, the, yeah. the transhumanists. I mean, no, post-humanists are like, yeah, fuck the human. A lot of it's <laughs> ego-based, for sure. You know, you want to lock down who you are, as you are, live forever, so you know, the machine looks like the way to do that. So yeah, it's always it's always a it's always a, a kind of a it's almost as it's reactionary again or extreme sick obsession with the human. That's like team human on on steroids. They're like, yeah, but it's t it's like, like how do we preserve this? The, how do we preserve this? It's the isolated human. I'm gonna freeze my brain. Yeah. Your brain doesn't matter. It's your brain in concert with all the other ones that matters. So how do we remain a little bit human in this machine cage that we're seeing? So. We're seeing, we, we spoke a little bit about the AI that's coming and we brought you to IBM Watson and we had an interesting sit down with those guys and, and I just wondered, you know, is there any escape from that? Is that yeah, I mean, the IBM, Watson, the IBM Watson demo was so reassuring to me because the thing really is primitive. It's a search engine. It's a search engine that has a little bit of, of real language abilities. You know, it's a search, it's Google. It's all it is, you know, but it is, you know, it, you type in your symptoms. I mean, so it's putting some things together as opposed to, you know, just one search. It's doing your kind of Boolean search for you. Uh, so I was totally unthreatened. And, and the, the, thing, the thing I've started to think is that, you know, I see these papers and articles written by some of our technology billionaires about the threat of AI and all that. And I'm starting to think, you know, this is, <laughs> this is advertising, you know? This is advertising, they can't do it. It's just like the guys, remember the guys with the MRI machines that were saying, oh, we're gonna slot you into the MRI and put Coke and Pepsi and we're gonna be able to, didn't do squats. So some part of your brain lights up, they don't know. They don't know what the heck's going on and it's proved to be stupid. And I'm starting to think that some of this is just sales. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yes, no, you're right about that. You're absolutely right. No, absolutely right on this. Some of it. I'm not saying all of it is sad. So it's not absolutely right. It's partially right. Some of it's also very scary. The thing, I'm less scared of the actual machines than I am of people with billions of dollars who want this stuff to happen. You know, people with billions of dollars who are aware of the tragedies that they're causing with the externalities of their corporations, and so they're busy building spaceships and bomb shelters and buying land in New Zealand and Anchorage, you know, to get away from the devastation they've caused. I mean, you can see it in the microcosm or the macrocosm. The person who's an executive vice president at the advertising agency who sends their kids to Rudolf Steiner School so they don't have to watch any of the commercials that they're making during the day, you know? There's no, there are, that's the, the one beauty of being in a connected guy in world is there's no more externalities. There's no, everything is present all the time. You know, we're breathing the same air. You can't just send something off to China. You know, that they, they, they are us, you know, and we're, we're kind of seeing that now. So there needs to be a, a perceptual change to a degree. If I ask the, the question of what technology yeah. wants, does it, what does it want? What does it want to understand? Doesn't want anything. Doesn't want anything. Doesn't want anything. No, it's the it wants whatever we want. Whatever we build the shit. Whatever we us. tell it to want. And right now, what we're telling technology to want is to extract as much value from the humans as possible, as money, <laughs> as time, and as data, and then use the data that you have about the person to market to them a future that they don't yet know they're going to, in order to reduce anomalous behavior. So Facebook knows with 80% accuracy that you're going to go on a diet in the next month. They want to get that 80% up to 90% or up to 95%. So they're going to start sending your, in your news feed, are you feeling fat today or what are you, you know, <laughs> they're going to push that. Because, so what is the object of the game for the algorithm is to reduce human spontaneity, to reduce the number of choices, to make you more predictable and to extract more value from you. So most of us now have the experience when we use these devices. I mean, gosh, if you're old like me, you'd go on the net back in the day for a couple of hours, you turn it off and you're energized because you were just talking to you know, a scientist or a kid from Japan or you found a document in a Tel Aviv library. And, oh my God. 
and you use you leveraged your time appropriately because you knew it was an asynchronous medium. You would download a conversation and then spend two hours before you crafted the paragraph that you would then upload into the conversation. So the internet was this place where you sounded smarter than you do in real life. <laughs> And you were afraid to meet the people that you talk to online because they're going to see I'm really just, oh my God, they're going to see. Could you imagine the internet as a place where people sounded smarter than they did in real life? You know, so, and somewhere along the way, really by the late 90s, once we decided we were in, a, in an attention economy and we made sticky websites, which was the beginning of captology, remember sticky? Stickiness, that was, like the, that was the, the object of the game, as if people really want to get stuck to our fucking website. Um, <laughs> And then the internet experience changed. And now most of us, when you use, the more you use the internet, the more anxious it's making you feel, right? We strap the device to our bodies and have it ping us and interrupt us every time, you know, someone pings us or updates us or someone gets shot or, you know. It's like, imagine a, an app that buzzed you every time someone gets bitten by a shark, you know? It's like, it's sort of that. That's what we're doing because that keeps us in that state of urgency. And then we feel, what, is it irresponsible? What if you don't know about, let's say someone gets killed by a terrorist and that happens now. What if we don't find out about that until this event is over? Does that make us somehow irresponsible humans? You know? What the fuck, right? <laughs> I am not obligated. I am not the AP, right? I am not Associated Press. I don't have to know everything that's happening in the world all the time. I'm just a person. There's people to do that. There's ambulances. They're on call. God. So, do you, look, do you think... There you go. <laughs> well done. <laughs> so do you think this whole thing is just going to collapse in on itself? I mean, throwing rocks at the Google bus was almost... You're kind of warning to say, look, this growth imperative, this, this idea that you're going to grow these things exponentially, it's all bollocks because you're basing your valuation on 5% of the GDP, right. which is fucking advertising and marketing. Right. Like, there's not enough money for you to get the returns right. on investment that you guys are claiming. Do you think the whole thing is just going to go... A lot of it's going to go... Um, <laughs> it's just how much pain that will cause <laughs> the rest of us. You know? Bezos is going to be fine. He just bought Whole Foods. He's feeding us, you know? What if we can afford Whole Foods? Yeah, exactly. He's feeding us. Yeah, saying. if you can't, you're going to starve, my friend. Um, <laughs> <laughs> learn, learn the 120-year diet of Roy Walford where you undernourish yourself. That's, that's what's coming. Um, but you live, longer if you, eat, you live longer if you eat less. Um, that's what they supposedly... Um, no, I mean... It's not just now, right? Deloitte came out with the, the shift index in 2011 where they, they did the research and they found out that corporate profit over corporate size has been decreasing for the last 75 years. That means corporations are very good at extracting all the money from an economy, but they're really bad at deploying their assets once they have it. So it's a kind of financial obesity where they can store and accumulate cash and, and, and sit on it, but they can't do anything with it. So what happens is they end up extracting all of the money from the marketplaces on which the companies are depending for revenue. So that eventually kills them. They, 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 will, um, they will suffocate themselves in that, like the 5,000 pound woman, you know, they, they, they can't move, they can't do anything. So yeah, that's gonna be a, a strange moment. Uh, but the way to prepare for that is the same way it's the same set of tactics that you would use to oppose it or resist it. You know, create resilient local economies, learn who's around you, where does your food come from, be friends with a farmer. Um, the, the, these kinds of things, the, the kinds of things you would do to prepare for the apocalypse are the same things that you should do to prevent the apocalypse. You know, and don't do it as preparation for the apocalypse. Do it as a new normal of of, of, of collaboration and realize that it's not ass backwards to do something that's fun and inefficient, you know, because if you take all the externalities into account, industrial agriculture is less efficient than permaculture agriculture. It's less efficient. You know, it's just we've, we've, we're playing on the operating system of corporate capitalism, of global corporate capitalism, and we've accepted that operating system as a condition of nature when it's not. You know, so yeah, it's, it, that one is over. It was invented for 
bad reasons by bad people in the 12th and 13th century, and it's, it's over. It's over, and they're going to fight. So digital technology comes, which offers us, I mean, some network problems and parallel dynamics and things we've got to work on. But it also offers us new opportunities to, to retrieve the peer-to-peer -peer economic mechanisms that we had before corporate capitalism and to do it in a new and highly dimensionalized way. We can actually uh, move towards you know, what you'd call a, a superfluid economy, where capital is no longer this thing that's deployed by a rich person, but is this, uh, it's almost like computing resources that's ready. Um, you know, even Kickstarter is a baby step towards that, you know, towards, towards this, this uh, readiness of capital, that we could move toward that. But of course, the powers that be, the wealthy as they always do, or even just institutional lethargy will have a reactionary response and use these very same technologies to resist um, that kind of transition. Are, are we seeing already good examples of what you're talking about out in the world? So we're talking about retrieval, but it's always useful to point an example that's happening right now that we can go, look, this, this is possible. Yeah, the danger, of course, with doing that is then everyone tries to model that one. You and know, monetize that one. Yeah. <laughs> and scale that one. Yeah. yeah. There you go. Um, but if you want to see some examples, I mean, uh, subscribe to Shareable. And you know, and pretty much every week on Shareable, they'll say, here are 10 platform cooperatives that are doing this. Here are 10 ride-sharing companies that where the drivers own the, the thing. Um, check out Inspiral in New Zealand, which is a, a, a network of uh, people-driven enterprises, like Lumio, which is a, uh, uh, a way of doing, I mean, it's interesting because they end up congruent all the way through. So Lumio is a, uh, uh, it's not a collaboration, it's a consensus building platform that was based on the General Assembly protocols of the Occupy movement. And they said, let's put that online so the communities can, uh, can, can negotiate um, solutions rather than using sort of winner takes all democratic process, sort of a, a uh, uh, you know, parliamentary process. So you don't end up with half the people upset. You end up with everybody kind of satisfied. You know, how do we how do we get to to consensus? So these these models, and then how do they build it? Well, they build it not with traditional VC, but trying to get uh, you know build it as a platform cooperative where the people working on it own the company. And, uh, there's there out there, you know, but the easiest thing is just to do it. There's also every family business pretty much in the world is that. It, to go to a pizzeria. Tony, how do you run this place? Well, I buy the flour, I buy the tomato sauce, I make the pizza, I sell it, I sell it for more than it costs me, and I feed my family. It's all good. You know, as long as he's not in a neighborhood where the rent's going up because there's some crazy, you know, sovereign wealth fund buying all the real estate and leaving everything empty and turning the stuff that we actually need into asset classes, um, it all works out. But, but that is the reality. That is the reality that we, we live in. And Doug, it strikes me, every time I listen to you, I, I have that moment of, we're fucked. Or oh, any time I read something by you, I have that moment. But it also strikes me that you're a dangerous man. A dangerous man insofar as people take your terms such as viral media and make that viral marketing. They hear you talk about cyberdelics and then all these marketing guys go, oh, you can get high on Oculus Rift. That's what this guy means. Let me quote some Rushkoff. There he is in my slides. You know, like, you have a lot to answer for. <laughs> You're giving the other side, if there is another side, if it is a dichotomy, the tools as well as the solutions. I mean, how do you deal with that issue where you sit down with a CEO and you go, you know, I can give you the tools or I can just tell you to get the fuck out and just like let this whole thing collapse? Like, what responsibility do you have, Doug? It's all my fault. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying, I'm not saying that I know. particularly, but I'm just saying I was, people I was, love your work because it is so translatable to yeah, both sides of the Yeah, I was surprised. You know, so I wrote this book, Media Virus, which was about how the hidden agendas in popular culture would now surface because we were going to move into a lateral viral uh, mediascape. And most of the people who bought that book were marketers who were looking, how do we create viral media in order to market what we do? And most of them didn't really understand what I was saying at all. You know, they, they focused on the figure, but not the ground. What I was really saying was that, that viral media succeeds to the extent that our cultural immune response hasn't yet 
been developed. So you mine into uh, uh, our, our immune deficiencies. And they kept thinking about, what virus am I going to do? What am I going to do? How am I going to get my product in that virus and then spread it? The only ones who really understood it were the uh, Calvin Klein people, who ended up doing a campaign based on media virus where they, um, they shot these ads that were supposed to look like child porn. Do you remember this? It was the underwear. So, Calvin Klein had just been bought by some other big company. Calvin Klein Underwear had been bought by a big corporation. They wanted to show that they were still kind of, had street cred. So they did these ads that looked like child porn, and then they were forced to take them off immediately, and there was all this secondary media about that. And that was the plan, of course. So that, that's a real viral construct, where you get secondary media that you don't have to pay for, and you create the sense of danger about your brand. Oh, you're cool, child porn. Oh, and you're in trouble, and oh, it's cool. <laughs> You know, so they did it, and I saw them at a conference. I went to this conference in like 1996, and the kids, the kids, um, and I was a kid myself at that point, but the kids from Calvin Klein who had done the campaign all have paperback copies of Media Virus, and they're like, oh, you signed my book. We based our campaign on what you did. Isn't that great, Army? Like, oh, my God. Look what they've done. I mean, and that was when I realized that, you know, that, when Gary Panter tried to convince Matt Groening that it was okay to let Fox have The Simpsons, because he said, don't worry, we're gonna take them down from the inside, and of course, The Simpsons funded Fox News, which has been you know, one of the worst things to happen in America, you gotta say, okay, which, is more, which has had more impact, The Simpsons or Fox News? It's almost a toss up, I don't know, it's, a, it, well, it's certainly a debate, it's certainly something to, to to think about. Simpsons has been around longer. Um, but that was the moment I realized, oh, OK, I'm going to have to be uh, more skillful. More skillful about it. I mean, but look, there's a lot of good people who are not skillful. Was Jesus skillful? <laughs> they killed a the guy at 33, right? <laughs> I mean, they, they, it's, hard, it's hard to be skillful, right? So it takes some time. So I've gotten a little bit more skillful. And I realized, first, I thought, Go the opposite way. Be clearly anti-corporate. So I started to write like books like Life Inc. You know, saying this is corporatism. This is where it comes from. This is why it sucks. Fuck you. Um, uh, and then you know, and they don't. They're just like push back, push back, push back. But some of this other, a book like Throwing Rocks at the Google Bus, which is really directed at business, is meant to prove to them, well, this isn't going to keep working, is it? You're doubling down on an extractive model where the end is is in sight. So what can you do instead? Well, here's all these circular economic, you know, more circulatory models. Here's, here's how commons has worked. Here's how this worked. Here's how you could do, do, it, um, do it better. And, and CEOs, most of them, they're actually human beings. They are still, you meet them. It turns, I've done the Turing test, whatever. They're, they're human. They're humans. Um, and I've had you know, two Fortune 100 CEOs weep with me in their offices. Weep. One of them, because he was cannibalizing the productive assets of his company in order to please the shareholders. He was selling off the last few remaining productive assets of the company because they have to grow. And the only way to grow at that point was, was with more money. And they also realized, sadly, the shareholders realized that productive assets make less money than abstract assets. So it's you know the Jack Welch lesson of the 1990s. He sold the washing machine parts, the industrial parts of GE, because he found out you make less money making and selling a washing machine than you do lending money to someone to buy a washing machine. You know, stay abstract. Don't have workers. Don't have stuff that you have to get out of the ground and things you have to ship and health insurance. Just be in the, be in the, the business of capital itself. It's what happened to Google. Google's become Alphabet. It's a holding company. Google, Alphabet buys and sells technology companies. That's what they do for a living. So it's a different... Uh, it's a different thing. That's the only thing, finally, the only thing that really scales is capital. No. There's three factors of production, land, labor, and capital. Land doesn't scale. Labor doesn't scale. That's why they have no seat at the table. It's just the developer and his VCs. You know, and if land doesn't have a seat at the table, we get climate change. If, if labor doesn't have a seat at the table, we get uh, 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 the, the, the diminution of, of humans. We get disenfranchisement. Is, is, is that possibly where the obsession with space and AI comes from? Because that's more land and that's more labor. Yeah. Yeah, in part. I mean, they don't, the people investing in AI, they have no idea what AI even is. You know, they really, they, they don't. They don't. 
Uh, and there's a lot of different kinds. I mean, there's a, di a lot of different possible trajectories for AI. But what I meant to say, though, was that the CEOs get this. You know, they, they really do, that business people are humans and get this. And there's a business argument to be made. So I'm getting more traction by telling businesses, look, your life will end if you don't begin to shift. And then teach them, well, look, you can't turn the whole company on a dime because when anybody like, you know, Indra at Pepsi announced that she's going to stop selling sugar water, the shareholders revolt. When the guy at BP says we're going to go solar, oh no, the, the stock crashes. You can't do it like that. You've got to do little prototype experiments. You know, so a bank can facilitate some crowdfunding. And, uh, you know, uh, you do, you, you, you don't, again, the CEO has to be skillful in how they pivot the company towards uh, creating some value instead of just extracting it. But don't you think, so when they, when they pivot these companies, yeah. it comes with the same culture that they have. So it astonishes me that JP Morgan are into blockchain right now. <laughs> it's just like, we got something new, we can use it, we can use it against those companies. And JP Morgan went, well, you know what? We'll have some of that. We'll have this, this Ethereum, this, this, this blockchain or technology ripple. Or, yeah. or ripple, yeah. you know, it, it feels like they're discovering and then they're using back for the same cause. Some of the tools can be embedded with our values if we choose to do so. How? By infiltrating engineering schools with humanities, ethics, uh, 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 professors. You know, the same way that, thanks, the same as, way as that- As a humanities professor <laughs> with the back going. <laughs> <laughs> no, but the, the National Association of Marketers in the United States, after FDR, what they realized was in order to promote capitalism, corporatism, and their version of the American way, what they would have to do is infiltrate the business schools of America and the economic schools with free market thinking. And they funded free market chairs, chairs for extreme, what we would call right-wing uh, business and economic theorists. We have to infiltrate engineering schools the same way. You know, right now, Gosh, you know, Cornell opens up an engineering school. Cornell, of all places, Ivy League, they open up an engineering school in New York with, uh, you know, Mayor Bloomberg's blessing, and they give them Roosevelt Island, and it's a school in entrepreneurial technology. It's a school in entrepreneurialism. It's a business school. It's a startup school. They're teaching them how to build Ubers. They're just trying to teach them how to build exactly the same thing that might be causing all this trouble. I mean, VF, when right. it... Occurred in 2011 was a reaction to that. University of Warwick also has this thing called WBS, which is Warwick Business School, mm -hmm. where my peers were like, we're going to get our job at PwC, KPMG, and Ernst & Young, and then we're going to have an earning potential by 28. And I went, fuck. <laughs> like, shit. Like, really? That's the mindset? And there's no changing that mindset for my generation. So then how do, how, do, how do I fucking do it? We're trying. Well, we're trying as much as we can. Fucking would help. <laughs> Seriously, a good babies, fucking, a good, a good fuck, um, really a good fuck would, would open up some of, these, some of these minds. I mean, they fuck, but you know how they fuck. Um, <laughs> seriously, I don't mean to be crude, but you know what I'm saying. They're not opening any chakras. There's nothing coming out of the crown. They're, they're keeping it down there. Um, you know, uh, People tease, the, t people tease people who are going um, to yoga for uh, productivity gains, uh, but uh, yoga, it, it changes the person eventually. You know, you can't open up the, you can't do a warrior one posture and not have a certain, uh-oh. You know, and you keep it down, uh-oh. I'm a human, I'm alive, I have love, I care about people, I feel connected, and then, and then stuff changes. Yeah, I mean, the first year or so, you, you buy a goat share and put your kid on organic food, you know, while you still do evil. But eventually, you know, uh, it opened up. There's ways. There's ways to stimulate uh, their humanity. The other way to do it, I mean, it's carrot or stick. That's the carrot, right? Open up the energy and all that. The other way is shit hits the fan. 
You know, whenever the shit hits the fan, what do humans do? They've got to for forge solidarity and stick together. You know, we got the, the best uh, local currencies and that we had in the United States was during the Depression. You know, that's what jump-started the economy, and then they made them illegal and forced them to go into the regular economy. But, uh, you know, the, the, uh, I would much rather it happen the happy way than the sad way, but yeah. Can, can those things, but can those things coexist? I mean, it, you, one of your peers, John Perry Barlow, said, you know, the web isn't gonna be a construction project, and it has become a construction project, so almost, I feel that there has to be a demolition, might be the way to go, or do you think that we can, we can fix the, we can fix the foundations whilst also building the buildings. The buildings yeah. might be slightly smaller, but they can, they can deal with these, these See, problematic foundations. I, I, st I still feel John Perry Barlow made a mistake by addressing the Declaration of, of Independence of Cyberspace to governments of the world. Yeah. Hear us. And, he, he, and I understand, we hated government at that point. Government had done Operation Sun Devil that arrested all these sweet little hackers who were just checking things out. Uh, you know, government was into the, the decency standards online. Government was gonna control the net. So we wanted government off the net. And what we didn't realize um, those of us who are just psychedelic hippies and not um, students of economics, was that if you get rid of government, what happens? Corporations are free to, to roam. It's like you get rid of all the bacteria and the, the fungus go nuts. You know? And that's what happened. So we ended up getting this, this, uh, corporatized, uh, th this corporatized net, which you know, it, it, it's a, it became a monoculture. So it, but no, I don't, I don't think we demolish. When I first experienced the net, I saw it as a safe haven for the counterculture, a safe haven for the squishies. You know, those of us who weren't trying to become yuppie scum or whatever it was at the time, we went online and had these weird human experiences. And now, you know, corporations came on, banks came on. I mean, for those of us who were online in 92, 93, 94, to think that banks would go on there would, oh my God. God, it just seemed so absurd because we also knew how insecure the whole thing was. But they've all gone on there. And now what I'm thinking is if corporate culture has colonized the net, then what if we recolonize the real world? In other words, they're up there. They're all in there. We lured them up. And then just like get them all up there. Us all come back and boom, 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 you know? And they're gone. Um, but I do feel like human beings, human beings, we find our strength on terra firma. You know, here. They have programmed the digital landscapes. We're not in IRC anymore. We're not using Eudora. We're not on Usenet. We are on their turf when we're online. And their turf is being designed to disempower us. Consciously, willfully, scientifically, and programmatically designed to disempower the humans who go there so that our value can be extracted. That's not conspiracy theory, that's just reality. So, this, I mean, not that we're standing on the ground meant much anymore either, but when you're standing, if you can find a piece of earth, do. Stand there. Find some friends in the real world. Touch them. Smile at them. Make eye contact. Get your mirror neurons going. Get the oxytocin flowing. And all of a sudden, you've got, you've got empathy. You've got love. You've got uh, uh, solidarity. And you get strength you know, that, you don't, that you don't have there. So I'm not saying give up on cyberspace. But right now, I feel like the real world is the, is the place for the subversive activity. You know, and online is... is uh, I almost don't mind relinquishing the net to them. I'm so fucking sick of that thing already, you know? Um, and, and I mean, we'll always have Google, right? We'll always have searching. You'll always have Wikipedia. You know, you, you, you support those things. But, ugh, you know, if they, if they really want to, it's not, it's, not, it's not worth it to me. The other thing I, I shamelessly like about you, Doug, is you have a theater background. If anything, you prove out that my useless theater degree might not be useless. <laughs> and, but more to the point, theater and art, where could that be, I don't want to say weaponized, but utilized in part of this sort of fleshly storytelling? I mean, is there something... That's what I'm doing every fucking day of my life. Uh -huh. 
That's what this is. And we call it nonfiction. <laughs> it's propaganda. It's propaganda. Of course it's propaganda. I mean, and propaganda is a form of art. It is. It's art for, for with a purpose. Yeah, use some facts, you know? <laughs> Just pepper it with some facts, and it's nonfiction. But, yeah, there's, I mean, of course there's a role for art. I mean, if anything, I'm finally... Uh, returning to theater. I mean, I left theater um, partly because I lost my best friend in a car crash, and it was I got into this whole sort of existential thing in theater. Just you do it, and then however great it was, it's almost like a fish tale or something that you're telling. It's like, oh, yeah, you had to be there. You had to be there, and no one ever believes that. But now I'm realizing that you had to be there is the best thing in the world. You had to be there. You know, and that's that reifying of humanity rather than uh, the disgrace. You know, that's that's the legacy is that real humans were there. So uh, I'm kind of I'm kind of returning to that. You know, art. You know, art is the art is the place to be. I mean, yeah. I mean, God, and art is also you know what we're going to do if we really get to the place where the robots till the soil and make all the stuff. And then what are we going to have left? Is art. That's all we're going to have left. And we'll create a market of art and trade yeah. with each other and whatever, you know. <laughs> who cares? But, um, but yeah, then, then, then human, human life becomes an, an, an aesthetic expression. I mean, that's, art's the highest. Art's the highest thing. But the theater background is what helps us understand the theater of digital technology. It's a stage. It's a social construction. You know, it's a fourth wall. It's, you know, it's... The same, the theater, same machinery. Right. Theater is, the, it was one of the first efforts by human society to generate dimensionality. It was before perspective painting. We're going to say, we're going to put these ones there and some of these ones there, and humanity is going to look at itself. You know, we're going to create this artificial, this my, my tot, mitosis almost. We're going to create this artificial dialectic in order to, to figure something out together. I mean, it's, it's, that's what allowed me to understand what the Renaissance was. The Renaissance was a leap in our ability to, to uh, uh, contend with dimension, circumnavigate the globe. You know, eventually we even got you know, um, calculus, perspective painting, um, uh, individual books where we all have our own perspective on, on the Bible. You know, and that's what we're just going through now is another dimensional leap. That's what I was writing about in Siberia. You know, we, instead of the, the printing press, we get the internet. Instead of perspective painting, we get the fractal or the hologram. Um, instead of uh, calculus, which is really post-Renaissance, we get um, uh, uh, chaos math. So uh, instead of, of, of circumnavigating the globe, we photograph the globe from space. You know, so we are contending with another dimensional leap. And you know, we can flatten it down because it's scary. We can flatten it down and say, oh, don't worry. You know, we're just extracting value from you guys, you know, rich and poor and all that good old duality stuff, the way that we're programming computers now. Or we can say, no, let's actually do this. Let's accept that scary fact that we're in this thing together. You know, that's why Gaia hypothesis was so uh, compelling to a lot of us in the early internet era. You know, not to take it literally that here we are hardwiring the global brain, but things are connected in ways that we didn't realize, like trees. Like we know now that all the trees in a forest, in a healthy forest, are actually connected by the mushrooms, mushrooms and, and other fungi underneath. And that when there's a healthy tree, the mushrooms will take some of the nutrients from that tree and give it to the sick ones, to the, to the suffering ones, I mean, what kind of collaboration Marxist <laughs> scheme is that? You know, but we don't even know. We think the soil is dirt and that each tree is individual, or we thought. You know, but once we, once we accept that, oh boy, there's a whole lot of ethical conundrums that happen. If you are me and I am you and we are all together, oh my God, what is that? You know, and this whole individual me ego thing turns out to be this little illusion I get to have because I'm, you know, physically seemingly separate from y'all. I mean, then what happens when we coordinate and can actually start to do things? And not as in some weird fascist goose step, but actually some kind of coordinated uh, 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 behaviors and insights. You know, that, the only way we get there is we don't get there through the kind of rectilinear solutions of the, 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 
dot com or whatever there of the digital uh, of digital networks. We get there through the soft, squishy human strangeness stuff. You know, we've evolved. 300, 400,000 years of weird stuff and, and, and uh, uh, various forms of synchronization and chronobiology and mirror neurons and rapport. And my God, why chuck all that, you know, for a goggle? You know, but that, but you know the 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 that's red, a crazy fucking no, thing. No, but the red like, theater's not safe. Even the VR guys are like, "Oh, you seen Punch Drunk? That's what we're creating with a fucking yeah, goggle." I know. <laughs> but guess they don't. They don't. Only the goggles really convince you how good the resolution of reality is. Look at the tracking of reality. I mean, it just composes anywhere I look. It's just like it's rendering <laughs> instantaneously. I mean, this is like, and look, I mean, the whole thing. I mean, you're like, fuck, this is good. This is good. Well, this is good, and we are all together, <laughs> and we have to take audience questions. Well, not because our questions, contributions. Well, audience contributions, because we should, we should question the audience. Well, well we part, this, part of this, fuck yeah. Fuck yeah. Part of this, part of this Especially was. the ones who didn't pay. Your, your. <laughs> Well, they, they're here for a reason, so, so the, the, there is the majority of the audience that didn't pay it, we would explain that another time, but so essentially we, we wanted to fill the room, we wanted to film the room with Douglas's friends and comrades, and uh, really to do a test bed for this, this whole thing of the Team Human Manifesto, because this is brand new, I don't, I don't know when the release date on the book is, you got about 18 I gotta write the fucking thing. I gotta write the fucking thing. So let's help Douglas write the fucking thing. So uh, we um, would love to bring up the house lights, um, the other thing is that we have a microphone that if someone from VF can be awesome enough, is Tom around, to run the mic. Um, Luke, if we could bring up the house lights and then Tom, if you could grab the mic from Luke. Um, we're going to take, uh, take some audience questions. You are being filmed because this isn't an ephemeral moment, but maybe I should just chuck the footage and just allow it to be uh, one of those ones. Then again, given my rate of editing these things, maybe we'll never see this. <laughs> so it might be a couple of years. So the question just here, David Wood. Hi, Douglas. Hey. In Team Human, how much of humanity are you supporting and, and uh, championing? And are there parts of human nature that you would say, actually, we should be leaving behind? I mean, you say you like human quirkiness and human randomness, and that's great. But as a self-confessed transhumanist, I would say that there are many aspects of hum human nature which are actually very dangerous in our world today. Things that made sense in evolutionary background, you know, it was good that we had a sugar craving, it was good on the whole that we were xenophobic, it was good on the whole for our survival that we were short-sighted and short-term short, short uh, term thinking. Um, but do you accept that there are elements of our long inherited human nature which are actually very dangerous in our world today and that we could use every tool at our disposal, whether it's yoga, whether it's meditation, whether it's diet, or whether it's even technology to make us smarter, more resilient, kinder people. So are you happy with the state of humanity? Or is t Team Humanity interested in the idea of a transformation of humanity to lose some of our limitations? I'm all for developing. You know, right now what I see is, you know, most digital technologies are being designed specifically to do the opposite of what you're saying. Let's leverage the known, exploitable, uh, impulsive, violent, fear-based, fight-or-flight responses of people um, in order to be able to manipulate them. So the, the current kind of human loathing, what I see, I, I feel like Silicon Valley sees humans as the problem and technology as the solution. And I see technology as yet another way to extend and express the best of humanity. So I would be much more into the um, you know, intelligence augmentation through technology than uh, uh, artificial intelligence you know, outside, outside of us. Um, and yeah, I understand that over time, just as we got comfortable with contact lenses and gold fillings and Graphite kneecaps, we're going to get comfortable with various forms of dry and wet wear uh, that extend certain, certain abilities. What I would want us to figure out before we did that is if we could make our economy less competitive. 
so that there's not the, the obligation to accept these technologies um, won't, be, won't be dictated by market demands. If you want a job, you're going to have to get Spanish. You're going to have to get the Spanish. That's, that's the unfair part. So I feel like we will only be truly ready to make these kinds of, uh, of changes when we, uh, when we understand kind of more about who we are and what we want. Because so far, you know, if we only are as, as, as emotionally or politically developed as we were when we got the automobile, say, you know, America was willing to redesign our country around the needs of General Motors so that guys who used to go home from work on the streetcar, drinking a beer and reading the paper, now had to operate heavy dangerous machinery for an hour a day and work an extra day a week just to afford that piece of machinery that they were now obligated to, to buy. And now you grow up thinking, well, you're going to need a car to get to work. Of course you do, because we built America to force that. Um, if, if we don't really understand that before we go here, um, I'm concerned. But yeah, I, I understand that making technologies is what people do. That's part of what makes humans human. Bees make hives, termites make mounds, beavers make dams. People make now digital technology. That's what kind of what we do, you know? And, and I got no problem with going for it. I'm still, I still have some of the excitement for this stuff that I did when I went on the well for the first time, I did 5,600 baud modem, you know, and saw that, wow, I can have a different kind of conversation. I can have access to people that I couldn't before, and what will happen? I also, I also believe, though, that there are so many complex systemic interdependencies in our cognition and our body, and the way our brain relates to our thyroid, relates to our glands, relates to our hormones, relates to the night sky and the day sky and the phase of the moon and how many people are around and when my wife's having her period and everything, um, that most of these technologies are so simple they don't take those things into account. I think and there's an app for that. Yes, yeah, but <laughs> if you optimize one aspect of a system, you change the whole system. So, you know, we just, I just want to tread, I want to tread carefully. Any other, any yeah, other questions? Yeah, could I buy that? Yes, yeah. sure. Pat, please. And please say who you are. We're always interested. We never find Hello, out. Hello, Douglas. Pat Ken. How are you doing? Um, what happens when it's gene human rather than team human? Um, you know, gene editing, I don't know whether it's hubristic or not, but it has this potential to sort of, you know, if it gets into the wrong hands and if the power structures are the way that they are, that you get this kind of genetic bio overclass. And um, I just reviewed the Homo Deus book, and that's that's his great anxiety. You know, is that there's going to be a bifurcation of this of the species, and so so human imagination gets us there. Um, and uh, and the, the the thing that uh, uh, the thing that Harari says he's a, he's a meditating Buddhist, so he thinks he's got a perspective on how he chooses. You know, so it's sort of like, is it mass? Is it mass meditation? Is it mass mindfulness? In order that we can deal with this ultimate decisionality, not just not just over you know digital culture, external extensions of the human in McLuhan's sense, but actually playing God with the stuff, the, 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 the genetic line. Now, to me, that the team human has to be, is that a line in the sand? You, do you defend team human against that? Is there a way that team human can play with that in a way that's collectively safe? How do we even think about that stuff? I mean, I guess what I'm hoping is if I help, if we help to, to build up uh, you know, sort of our human resilience and human, uh, whatever our, our human immune system is, you know, through homeopathic doses of, of nonfiction and theater, um, <laughs> that we will have more uh, 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 ready intuition on how to make choices like that. I don't feel like you know, and I've been reading a bunch, and Richard Barbrick made me read all this stuff. Yeah. But I mean, I've read, you know, my Aristotle through Kant, through you know Heidegger, and 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 even you know Deleuze. I, yeah. Bravo. So I, 
but, but I don't feel. <laughs> but <laughs> I'm, I feel I, I feel as though a system of, a system of thought retro, you know, retrofitted back to this whatever uh, the the more organic sensibilities I'm attempting to to stimulate uh, doesn't really doesn't really work. But what you what the my counter question is, and this is the thing I'm wrestling with, is are we at the point where the only way out is through? And in other words, if we know that the topsoil of the planet's gonna be useless in about 40 years, or 60 by, by conservative estimates, no topsoil, if that's really true, then why put the brakes on Monsanto and capitalism and the mafiosas that they hire to you know, poison whatever fields and force the use of their stuff? I mean, there's an argument to be said, well, look, we've gone too far. They've already pushed it. The only way out is gonna be to do, to fund as much Band-Aid fixes as we can while hoping that people are developing other technology. I don't know. I tend to be of the belief, not that we can go backwards, but that we can, in a kind of Bucky Fuller-ish way, develop light technologies and, and uh, use, there's plenty of great ideas for how urban waste could be used to replenish the topsoil and recirculate things. Rather than moving to a, a, a recycling of waste society, we go to a zero waste society. I mean, there's all these, do we, is, is there a way to do it with, or do we have to go pedal to the metal? Mm. But the, Kim Stanley Robinson has this book 2312, have you read it? Mm. And what, what he does with longevity is to go and explore the asteroids. You know, so if you're living 150 years in Kim Stanley Robinson's 2312, you go, you go explore the asteroids and you figure out your life path over 150 years. Some of it's 10 years working, some of it's 15 years doing this. It's like a complete, but the ambition goes beyond beyond the earth. It goes exploratory, you know, and maybe DARPA should be ARPA rather than DARPA. You know, maybe that's maybe better institutions is another way to think about how we deal with radical innovation. Yeah, I mean, because I'll tell you, as an American and a cyberpunk, I don't like being on the side of saying, oh, let's slow down. You know, that's a, it's, it's a, little, a little strange for me because, you know, you want to be, let's go, you know, Frank Baum, Wizard of Oz, just, you know, pick yourself up by your bootstraps and just think it, be it, live it, you know. But, uh, oof, um, it doesn't feel that conscious. I, 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 I almost wonder if Naztec enabled by a, a super intelligent AI would go the way of Gaia and create perfect equilibrium and kill a bunch of companies and keep a bunch of companies and... Allow us to sustain sustain that way. Perhaps. Still, I still <laughs> honestly don't know what a super intelligent AI is. None well, of us do. Okay, good. Yeah. You know what I mean? There's, there's. I know we're building things, but I feel like that feels more like a meme than a technology or a, a, a thing. And I understand it's useful to have it as a construct, but uh, not if we end up navigating using it as some sort of compass, either as a compass of attraction or, or uh, negation, because it's not necessarily real. What is real are the ambitions of a new elite of billionaires who think humans are no better than zombies. You know, and that's sort of where, uh, where I feel safe um, uh, making pronouncements and taking action. Stephen. First of all, Douglas, um, I agree with the critical side of what you're saying. So the, the question, the kind of issues I want to raise has to do with the positive vision. I mean, one of the things that you said at the very beginning, which I thought was very, very sharp and, and something people should keep in mind, is this ability to uh, reappropriate the past for present day purposes and how people uh, on, quote, our side should do it. But with that in mind, I want to say something about what the capitalists have been able to reappropriate from the past. And, and I think uh, David has already alluded to this. And this is the idea that in some sense you imagine the human being in, in the natural state as being fallen, right? And that somehow we have to kind of rise to what our potential divinity is. And so even if we don't have the theology behind it anymore, we're going to use science and technology as the way of bootstrapping out of that. Now, it's entirely possible in the course of doing that, as we have been doing for the last so many thousands of years and so forth, that there will be some people who want to get off the bus. Perhaps you're one of them. In other words, you might want to, as Pat just brought up, subspeciate. 
right? So in other words, the kind of world that you're talking about, because when you were talking about, oh, I want the texture of life, you know, I, I, I want this ability to stop this stuff and get off the internet and deal with people face to face and stuff like this. This sounds like late 19th century bourgeois ennui, right? The world's moving too fast. And the only people who were actually saying this kind of shit were people who were already pretty well off. Right? They didn't have to worry about where their next paycheck was coming from, and they didn't have to worry about stuff like that. Right? Uh, and, and, and the thing about capitalism, whatever you want to say about it, is it generally thinks that human beings, on the whole, can always do better. But guys like you think we've already done well enough. Right? Guys like you think, in a sense, we've already done well enough. We've already figured out what it is to be a human being, what it is to have texture in life. And in some sense now, all the technology that's happening today and in the future is going to rob us of where we should be. And this is a very bourgeois kind of point of view. And so if I were somebody from Silicon Valley, looking at a guy like you, I say, we create reservations for people like you, right? It's not gonna cost that much for people like you to interact with other people, especially since you insist on not scaling up, right? That we could put you in these little communities, right? Where you could interact with people all you want without the internet, without anything, and you could, and you could be like it was in the early 20th yeah. century or well, wherever you think nostalgia. Say, was. But what I would say, what I would say is, if that's true, they'll do if, it for if, you, man. No, I'm sure wait, they'll do it for you. If that's true, then why are you still sending African children into caves at gunpoint? Then why are you uh, letting that's Chinese a diver people? You, look, that's a diversionary no, it's tactic. Not. No, no, I want to talk about your positive goal. Your positive goal is one that could be realized by a few self-organizing, self-interested people who are no, given it's not. enough no, space see, to wait, do it. No, it's not. No, where you're Google. confused, where you're confused is, you think that the idea of of touching reality and engaging with other people is my goal. It's not my goal. That's the means to an end. How is that it means because right now, Silicon Valley is building technologies to hurt and kill people, to disorient yes, humans. And, and, I believe, and I believe that if they got in touch a little bit with humanity, that they might do do less that so. That is ridiculous. That's the most ridiculous thing you've said. So we, no, we, we do have time. We do have time because the bar, really the bar will be open later for fighting. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's not ridiculous. Ghislaine Boddington. Ghislaine Boddington, please. So I'm Ghislaine Boddington. I want to ask you directly, I work on embodied intelligence and on body technologies, so I want to ask you about young people and how you feel about the new generations coming up and what we've seen happening in different parts of the world in terms of using social media and the various conversations they're in, in terms of understanding that they're one of millions and that they're in a very different psychological place than we are, and in terms of their mass push behind social purpose and good causes. How do you see the next generation? Because that's what's important. It's not us, actually. It's the 10-year-olds today and where they're going. I mean, I can't lump them all into a one big group. I mean, I am excited by the fact that young developers in Silicon Valley now consciously take less capital, so they'll have to pay back less. They go for small, smaller valuations rather than big ones. They watch shows like Mike Judge's Silicon Valley and realize the joke that their elders have been involved in and that they could do something. They don't have to pivot to something evil. I'm encouraged, and don't tease me, I'm encouraged by the response to, um, 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 Little what's her name's concert when they blew it up. Um, what's her? Ariana. Ariana. I mean, did you see the youth reaction to that? And you could tease them, and they even did on CNN. They acted like, oh, look at the little hearts, and look at these little silly kids. No, these were people consoling. It was thousands, thousands of people consoling each other and forging solidarity in the wake of a uh, of a disaster. Um, tremendous hope. Tremendous hope. I mean, at the same time, I see. Uh, uh, you know, all sorts of bullying and, and, and icky things, you know, happen online as well. I mean, in, just in my, in my neighborhood, uh, two girls were having a sleepover and one girl uh, did a Facebook Live on the other 11-year-old girl while she was sleeping overnight. And your parents called that girl's parents to complain and that girl's parents said, no, we're not, we're not taking that off. You know, that's her media. You know, it's like, oh my God. It's, it's, so there's, there's, there's uh, I don't think it was evil, but you know, there's also some some guidance and and confusion. But no, I do have 
I do have hope for the millennial generation, particularly when they're not co-opted by things like uh, all these kind of fake cause MTV, do something, get sponsored by Pepsi to, you know, you know these, these uh, uh, they can be sidetracked easily. But no, I'm, I've got faith. That's why I think education, that's why I'm teaching in a college now. You know, it would seem to be the only, uh, the only path. Well, Douglas, you, ha you have a 12-year-old. Yeah. I sort of wonder, what is the Douglas Rushkoff School of Parenting? What does that look like? I mean, how are you going to help her navigate through, I mean, the next 5, 10, 15? We'll see as we get there. You know, I'm trying to help her with, you know, now I'm helping her with, she's 12, with hormones, with social life, with mean girls, with... You know, she's not on social media or anything, so I don't have to worry about that. But she's just not that interested. Not that you know of. <laughs> yeah. Well, all media is social media, uh -huh. right? So. Do you stop it? Do you stop her from using social? No. Media? No. No, not. I don't have to yet. But um, no. <laughs> but but no. We we. I got involved in my uh, in the in the school in the elementary school. We're in a small school district and helped the educators and and and. Uh, community understand that you're supposed to be 14 years old before you use this stuff and you know so you know did, did a little bit of, of uh, non scare tactic uh, new media education but yeah I'm, I'm I'm just really interested in how this translates from the physical to the virtual and back to the physical again and actually how you see that coming through in that younger generations in terms of um, mass gathering too. I mean, the Women's March is a good example, not just for younger generations, for across generations, but how these things, many examples, there are many examples out there, have gathered people to take action. As in multiple small groups coming together and so multiple collective environments collecting to make actions which are physical again. Right, and then, you know, the disparagement of things like the William, Million Woman March, or whatever it ended up being called, is that, oh, there was no traction, oh, they didn't get to policy, oh, they didn't, but, you know, we get back to that McLuhan sort of medium is the message thing. What does it mean when a million people gather in a place just that, you know, in itself? And is that something I know? And it gets new age fairy, airy fairy, and right, does it really change the world or not when you have um, people gather doing that? Disembodied, isn't it? it actually becomes physical again. Right. And I still, and maybe it's religious, but I still have some kind of a faith that that is actually changing something, you know? There was a question just behind you. Um, hi, Douglas. Um, thanks for flying all the way over here. It's very much appreciated. Um, my name is Chris Hogg. I do a bit of teaching at Goldsmiths. And I was recently reading that in neurological development from the ages of 12 to 18, a teenager's brain is pruning connections, getting rid of the stuff that it needed to make sense of the world in the first 12 years. And then from the age of about 25, or no, sorry, at the age of 18, 19, it begins making connections again. Do you see any corollary between that and social media, which is only really about 13 or 14 years old? Are we entering an age where we should perhaps be pruning our connections? Yeah, I mean, I love that. I, I, the great, one of the great things about digital culture and digital devices and all is that they really do tend to recapitulate um, other stuff, you know, so just as, you know, the phylogeny recapitulates ontogeny, you know, we, we, we can overgeneralize, but yeah, those processes are interesting. I, I think most people are more in a pruning phase with their social media now than they are, and with their, all their media. Yes. I mean, and partly it's because the space got just so competitive and so crowded. I mean, how many messaging apps are there now? And, and the messaging apps inside the other apps, there's just a zillion of them. I mean, what, you know, do you aggregate them into the mega messenger, or do you just get rid of some? Is so it, are we yeah. growing up with our media? Is that, do you think, is there hope in that stuff now? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think we are. Uh, but I think the people writing the business plans of these companies are just as aware of that as you are. You know, I think we're in an arms race, really, with ourselves. You know, but with the with with the other team of us, you know, that's that. And I don't think that I don't even think they're really on another side. I just think they're asleep. I think they're just accepting the they they get to work. You know, they get their job and they pull out the loose leaf notebook that was left by the people before, and they are mechanized. You know, so I'm so much less afraid of an AI than I am a, a mechanically behaving human. Probably have time for two more questions. Gentleman here, Tat. 
Good evening. Uh, my name is Tat, and um, I only found out about what you do recently, as in tonight. <laughs> and I'd like to basically say, Me too. <laughs> <laughs> I like to say, I'm Team Human. But how can we spread the word of Team Human and sustain our integrity without the technology? And you know, obviously, maintain our integrity. You know, so how can we, for example? become Team Human, a global movement with our social media and becoming hippies and people like Charlie Manson's camp was. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? Like, how can you, how can you actually become, how can you spread the word without like s isolating yourself from society and social media? Because I'm all Team Human, yeah? But how can I spread the word without tweeting it to my thousands of followers? You can tweet it. Yeah, but you see my what point. So it's like, how, how do we get that balance is what I'm asking. I'm asking you, for the balance. Right. You get yeah. the balance, I believe, and again, this may be wrong, as you would say, but I believe we get the balance by, by learning how to sense in our, how we're responding to something physically and emotionally. I mean, I know sometimes you're at work and you have to do something you don't like, and I get that, and you get nauseous because, oh, I don't want to do this thing. Um, you know, I don't want to upsell this person on buying another belt with their jeans, and you know, and it goes against whatever, and the more you go against your sort of uh, core intuition, kind of the more distant you feel with it. Um, so I just think it's a matter, of, you know, each of us just pausing to choose consciously whether to do something or not is fucking revolution at this point. That's human intervention in the machine. Just choosing is so radical right now. You know, so I think that's all you have to do. You say, should I tweet this? Yeah. I'm gonna tweet this. I mean, I'm doing a podcast that's using all sorts of digital technologies. And it was like, which, which platform is it on? It's on every fucking platform I could find, you know, Pippa and iTunes and blah, blah, and boo boo, you know, whatever. It's on, on all of them, you know, and if I find so out. So basically, Team Human can work with the machine. It can, of course. Yeah, that, that's cool. Machines are here, you got can openers, you know? It's, it's, it's fine, you know, there's all kinds of machines, but sometimes you look at a machine and go, oh, look at this. I could put Team Human, the message, on all these bullets and then just machine gun spray a crowd. It's like, they'll get the message, um, but oh, that's not a good one, that's not. That well, thank you very much, you answered my question. I just wanna say, yeah, I'm Team Human and I just was trying to figure out if we can maintain a right. balance with no, both. Yeah, yeah, I'm not arguing to abandon technology. I'm not, although it'd be kind of fun. Um, See, yeah, it'd be fun. There yeah, yeah. But fun, fun is fun is fun. Um, it would be fun. But I'm not saying we should abandon technology. What I'm saying is we should just have, we should participate consciously in our our uh, uh, how we utilize technology. Just the old programmer be programmed. Are you uh, are you the user of your technology or are you being used by it? You know, and you can really feel that, I think. And if you can't feel it, I believe, if you can't feel it, then spend time with another person, look in their eyes, breathe with them, have a conversation, have sex, hold someone's hand, go in a room with people, and then go back. And I think, and I believe you will be better prepared to gauge what this technology is doing to you. And um, one or two more questions, just here, please. Uh, my name is Camilla Bustani. Hi, Dust. <laughs> um, my question is about the the clash between the short term and the long term, and the the sort of the speed at which things happen on some levels, and the the the, the fact that they actually happen quite slowly on others. So, for example, I'm really interested in the two CEOs who were in tears. Um, I, I wonder if they'll survive in their job, really, um, because the uh, the speed at which they are required to um, make profits for their companies that their shareholders demand, uh, the time horizons are much shorter than the time horizons of the damage that they're doing. So how do you persuade them? I mean, um, Milton Friedman said that corporations are like psychopaths. They act in their self-interest on drugs, right? So uh, it's it's rational for companies to maximize profit for shareholders and um, they operate on short terms because their financiers operate on short terms um, and their investors operate on short terms and it, and it kind of 
multiplies that way. So how do you how do you persuade these companies, which are increasingly sort of hegemonic, um, particularly when they've already bought land in New Zealand or Alaska? Uh, how do you persuade them to take a longer term view for the good of humanity as opposed to for the rational good of their corporation? I mean, there's a few. You can r regulate them. You can <laughs> stop. You, we can stop buying from them. You know, which is, I mean, tricky when they have monopolies. But at the same time, I mean, you can, you can. I mean, I, I'm not even talking about organized boycotts. Just start consuming from those where, I mean, gosh, if Jeff Bezos owns Whole Foods, I mean, not that we can afford it, but hmm, um, there's an interesting thought. Um, and. Uh, I think c show them how it's what they're doing is bad business. First, it's a myth that CEOs are obligated to return value to shareholders. That's not that's sort of a, a legal myth. It, they're obligated to uh, also to preserve the long-term uh, integrity of the company. You know, and I mean, not the shareholders will kick them out for doing that, but um, it's not like they're going to get sued. It's not like some some. Uh, legal problem. Another regulatory shift would be uh, uh, to change tax policy. Right now, we tax dividends high, at least in the state, dividends high, and capital gains low. So that makes investors, they don't want dividends, they don't want earnings, they don't want revenue, they want growth. Um, why have a tax code like that unless you are trying to encourage growth and discourage circulation? You know, the, the other is, is, it's just, I hate the catastrophic kind of conclusions, but they are, they're, they are crumbling. They really are. The, their ability to make a profit is just, um, it's just diminishing. And right now, the way you get shareholders is with false advertising. I mean, Tesla, yeah, they got some good technology and all that, but come on. Tesla's not bigger than GM, except in you know, market cap. So, uh, I, there was, a, there was a time when people I knew would, smart people, would come up with ideas for movies and run out to Hollywood and try to get a CAA agent and get like a million dollars for their movie treatment. That was like, when I was coming up, that was the original lottery that people were playing. And now they're doing it, same thing with business plans. You don't write a screenplay, you write a business plan. And the business plan is a fiction. You know, these are, for the most part, are not real things. They're just ways of getting a Series A or a Series B or an IPO, and then, ha ha. You know, and the ones that are real, I mean, like Twitter is a real company that makes $2 billion a year. That's the failure, because they can't grow anymore. They've reached, uh, they've reached equilibrium. So uh, I think, I don't know, I feel like we're becoming more and more aware of that. Where uh, the, the place where I get concerned is not almost the consumer type companies, but the ones that are actually capable of changing our genes, or our physical environment, the sort of more Monsanto, Genentech sort of, that sort of engineering is tricky. I mean, I'm not a vaccine conspiracy person, but I would be a genetic re-engineering conspiracy person, I think. Right now, I would anyway. And I, I don't believe that, I, I do believe that Monsanto, for one, is willing to create harm in order to necessitate the, the use of their products. And the use of their products actually, they don't just pollute, they actually change uh, systems in, in really profound ways. I don't know how to convince them otherwise. And when you talk to them, they are saying, look, Africa's gonna double in size in the next what amount of years? We gotta be able to grow alfalfa on cement if we're gonna survive. And shut the fuck up, Rushkoff, by slowing us down and lowering our share price because we are humanity's last best hope for survival. And no, of course not. But um, they can sow a seed of doubt though, you know, and, but, and they are diehard believers in that. So Douglas, virtual futures was always the attempt to find the others, the others who think in a similar way, but more importantly, uh, are active, and I want to know what the final message for this audience who will go out and do something is. The final message. <laughs> Before the inevitable doom. There is no final message. I mean, that's really, you know, <laughs> that's, 
So everything and nothing. No final, has I been mean, answered. the thing I've been telling people. I mean, and it was a, from a Timothy Leary quote when he was asked, you know, by some young psychedelic girl, "Oh, I've had my trip. What do I do now?" And he said, "Find, find the others." Um, so I've been saying, "Find the others" a lot. Um, but what I really mean by find the others is not just find the others of us. Find the others, mm -hmm. the real the others. And if we can really find them, you know, I can locate them, but I can't yet find them. If we can really find them, I think we, uh, we establish rapport and then maybe uh, something, they start doing something better. I think the real others are alone. When I look at, say, Donald Trump, I don't see someone connected to the humans around him. I see a scared child trying to please everybody around. Why don't they like me? Just like me. I'll, just, I'll say this. I'll say that. I see that. And if I could find him, if I could find him, you know, really hug him hard. Um, yeah, it's a bourgeois. But you know what I mean. Um, but you know what I mean. That, that if we could somehow find, find the human in those people, find that, and, and, and somehow draw it out, uh, then, uh, then we make the world a better place. Because finding the others who are like us, I mean, that's good too. We forge solidarity, march in the streets and all that. I mean, I'm labor. Yay. Um, <laughs> but there's maybe even more work to be done than that right now. So Douglas, you might be the last human human. Uh, I just wanna, just wanna say to our audience that it seems that the, the chance is either to choose, uh, to, just to choose the presence of the quirky, uh, random, squishy things that make us human, and maybe that's what we can do. Um, do I'll tell next. you, the, 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 the fact, what used to make me valuable was back when I was 27, 28 years old, I was the person who could explain the digital realm to all of the analog people out there. And now that I'm, what, 56 or something, I feel like I'm one of the last people who can tell digital people what analog reality was. Uh, so it's, it's, it's not just it's sort of a, a Gen X nostalgia, but it's, there's something we're leaving behind right now. And I just want you all to know what that is. And I want you to do it consciously rather than automatically. Well, we... we might just want a little bit of that. And I just want to say thank you uh, to the hospital club, especially to Luke Aziz and Jeffrey Jay, who, uh, who make this possible, to, to our incredible film team, to Tom at Virtual Futures, to Dan and, and everybody who comes together to make these these possible. If you like what you, we, you see, get involved, please. Find out more about us at Virtual Futures pretty much everywhere on the web. And I want to end with this, which is how we end every Virtual Futures. <laughs> the future oh. is always... <laughs> <laughs> the future is always virtual. And some things that may... There's no fucking point. There's some things that may seem imminent... Oh, or inevitable never actually happen. Fortunately, our ability to survive the future is not predicated on our capacity for prediction, although, and in those much more rare occasions, something remarkable comes of staring the future deep in the eyes and challenging everything that it seems to promise. I hope you feel you've done that today. Please join me in thanking the incredible Douglas Rushkoff. The bar is now open. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. You're good.